can go ahead, Andrea. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Worship with Parkway United Church of Christ this morning. We're so glad that you're tuning in and watching and worshiping with us this morning. And as is tradition for Parkway, we um, just want to say that you are welcome here with all of what you're carrying and all that you're trying to lay down. You are welcome here. No matter your sexual orientation or gender identity or expression, you are welcome here. No matter your zip code or what's in your bank account, you are welcome here. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. At this time, we'd like to move into our passing of the peace. I'm having to pull it up on my phone, the wonders of technology. So <laughs> at this time, if you just want to raise your hands to the screen and just say peace and just imagine you're just passing all this energy and love from your heart to me, because I need it, um, to Izzy and Craig and to one another, peace. Now we're going to move on to our celebrations and prayer concerns. Craig, if you don't mind doing that. You're just going to put your prayer concerns in the chat. Um, know that we'll just read your first name and not your last name to provide some confidentiality. So we have uh, a couple of uh, prayer concerns of which I am aware right now. Susan Dyer is in uh, Nevada Forsyth Hospital. Uh, she tested positive for COVID-19 early in the week. It is now not showing any symptoms and is doing okay. So we hold Susan and, and Dorsey in prayer. Uh, Nathan uh, is at uh, High Point Hospital with, uh, and is in a coma due to uh, blood sugar uh, issues. And so we hold Lee and Nathan and Nathan's family in our deepest prayers and regards. Uh, Anne Mackey is also uh, offering up prayers for Nathan and Lee. Any other prayer concerns or celebrations that people wish to share? Diane offers prayers for continued healing for sister, her sister-in-law who's had a heart attack She's home and doing pretty well. Uh, uh, Izzy, to my ex-husband's brother who passed away on Monday, please pray for the entire family. Uh, Karen Ock seeks prayers for Brother Steve, who is still in the hospital. God's steady love endures forever. We're going to hear a, a recording of Sophie Seavers uh, leading us into a uh, take, oh, take me as I am. As we move into a time of silence, we'll hold a few minutes of silence, and then we'll conclude that silence with a prayer Jesus taught in the language and tradition of your choosing. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what 
I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Join me in praying now for the commonwealth of creation using the words of Jesus of Nazareth. Our mother, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll hear now uh, our scripture reading for today, offered by Izzy Mokwin. Izzy, you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Forgive me for that. Excuse me. I'm, I'm very sorry to be doing this. My computer and everything is acting up on me. I'm sorry, but I can't seem to pull up the bulletin at the moment. This is very embarrassing. Izzy, would you like me to read? Oh, I hate to have, um, I guess you're going to have to, because I just lost the bulletin on my email, on my phone. I'm very sorry, because I really want to do this so bad. We'll have you offer a closing prayer. This is from Mark, uh, chapter 10, verses 28 through 45. Hear uh, these holy words. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. 
Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many will be, who are first will be last and the last first. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were afraid. And taking the 12 again, Jesus began to tell them what was to happen to him saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after th three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus then said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And then the ten heard it, and they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called to, to them and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Izzy. If y'all will, just um, join me in prayer before I share what was laid on my heart. Um, holy love and wonder, may it be you that comes through and not me. Help get myself out of the way and help this to reach who it needs to reach and may it plant some seeds and help spur us forward in the good work, God. In your name we pray. Amen. The more I read about Jesus' life, the more I realize that he didn't worry much about keeping friends. I don't know if it's the fact that I'm closer to 30 and have a lower tolerance for things that no longer serve me or what, but I get it. He knew what he was preaching would be something that would cost him his life. It makes sense that it would cost him friendships too. Let's face it, the gospel isn't good news for everybody. Heck, sometimes it's not even good news for me. Often I am Peter. See, we've left everything and followed you. I imagine Peter sounding huffy and maybe even with a tinge of, but this just isn't fair to his voice. Who among us wouldn't want a great pat on the back for doing the bare minimum, for doing what we're supposed to do? Yes, I admit that acknowledgement and gratitude are wonderful things, but not when I should have been doing them all along. If this scene was set in modern day, I believe it would go something like this. But Jesus, I called out my third cousin who I only see at family reunions and never talk to on Facebook for being racist. Isn't that enough? Or this, but Jesus, I just can't handle all that's going on. I'm holding those little kids at the border in my thoughts and prayers. Isn't that enough? I saw on Facebook several posts from white folks 
apologizing for racism after the lynching of George Floyd. These same folks were also reaching out to the few black folks they knew and were apologizing. However, words and actions are two different things. I saw a meme floating around about how removing episodes from popular sitcoms and renaming places are great, but that's not what black folks and people of color were asking for. They're asking for justice and we paint streets and murals with Black Lives Matter. They're crying out that they can't breathe and white people, we cover our ears and say not all cops. James and John walk up to Jesus and say, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and on your left in gl your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared. White people, myself included, want to feel good for doing the bare minimum, while people of color are doing all of the legwork. There was an influx of people asking black people what they could do in order to fight racism, when in all honesty, they should have been doing their own research. Black folks have been fighting against racism and injustice for their whole lives for 400 years plus, and many of us have just been able to see what's going on. It's not enough for me to be just not racist. However, I must be anti-racist as Ibram Kendi states. Professor Kendi writes, to be anti-racist is a radical choice in the face of history, requiring a radical reorientation of our consciousness. It's not enough to say that I'm not racist. I must work on realizing the ways in which I'm still influenced by white supremacy and complicit in the system. I need to continue realizing that the work is never done and that I will mess up. I will mess up and there is grace. Kendi, in an interview with Brene Brown, mentions that feeling shame about racism is not the same as being shamed for racism. And if you've ever followed or read any of Brene Brown's work, she mentions that shame holds so much power over us because we don't speak about the things of which we feel ashamed. In fact, if we were to talk about our shame, we'd realize that it's something we as humans all have in common. We're all afraid to talk about what we're ashamed of. Kendi in the interview stated that at the heart of anti-racism work is confession. When we talk about our shame, it loses its control over us. As Mr. Rogers would say, anything mentionable is manageable. It's hard when I thought I was pretty progressive <laughs> to realize I still had a lot of work to do. It's painful when you say the wrong thing and the awkwardness that ensues. <laughs> However, the pain is going to happen. We can't avoid it. And honestly, it's healthy to sit in what's uncomfortable. It's the least we can do as white folks. Being uncomfortable leads to growth. In fact, Bell Hooks writes, all our silences in the face of racist assault are acts of complicity. We should be asking questions and challenging the things we've always been taught. I need to stop thinking of myself as one of the good white people. I need to consider the ways in which I have been complicit in the system and still am. Glennon Doyle Melton in her book, Untamed, writes, now that we no longer have to be good, we can be free. We think we are being good or polite when we're being not racist, or we avoid the hard conversations for fear of not getting it exactly right. 
But if we took a step back to realize that things are not always going to be perfect, we could be free. Twice in Mark chapter 10, Jesus mentions that those who want to be first have to be last. That the Son of Man came to serve and not to be served. In light of what the Spirit has st been stirring in my heart for this word this morning, I was considering ways in which I can make myself last. I'm a firm believer of when you know better, you do better. Siblings of color, this is the part of the sermon where it might be triggering to hear. And I get it if you need to check out in order for you to take care of yourselves. Lately, I've been thinking of my first experiences of realizing that I was white. One of my first memories is kindergarten or first grade. All of us are in the cafeteria at lunch, and the city I grew up in was one where Hispanics and Latinx folks were populating at a rapid rate. Two of my classmates were talking to each other in Spanish, and my white teacher, all of which were white in 1998 through 1999, told them to only speak in English, that it was rude to speak in Spanish in front of everyone because no one knew what they were saying. I remember witnessing this and thinking, right, speak English, this is America. I remember Mama's factory job closing down and she came home and said, they're moving my job overseas to Mexico because it's cheaper, because those Mexicans will work for nothing. I remember her blaming Mexicans for misfortune and not the corporation. I remember fifth grade after watching Gone with the Wind for a class that we were to choose to write as either an abolitionist or a slave owner during the Civil War. I chose to write as a Southern abolitionist because on one hand, I kind of knew that slavery was bad, but on the other, my family was proud of being Southern. And even in the early 2000s, we couldn't stand Yankees. Yankees who moved in and took over. Yankees who burned Atlanta. I never once considered that my classmates who were black or Hispanic wouldn't have anyone that they could relate to in that assignment or that they would have to choose between pretending to be two different types of white. Even then, they weren't being seen. I remember my middle school being a failing school because we were in the poorest parts of Hall County, Georgia. It was also the part of Hall County where most of the black people and Hispanics and Latinx community was located. I remember the year that they sent letters home to parents saying they could have their children bus to more successful schools. I remember going to high school in Blue Ridge, Georgia, after we moved from Gainesville, Georgia, after my eighth grade year. It was a predominantly white community. The high school I, had, I went to had a mascot that was a Confederate rebel. Dixie was played at every football game. This was in 2008, and it's still this way to this day. The rebel flag was on everything, letterman jackets, class rings, everything, and Fannin County, white was right. When looking back over my life and experiences, I was steeped in white supremacy. It was everywhere even as a child. It catches you young. The first time I ever learned about systemic racism and had my ideas really challenged was by my Canadian college professor in my junior year of college when we read Bell Hooks. Our professor started out with a slideshow of female superhero action figures, all scantily clad. He asked us to say what was missing in the picture, and of course, all of us said that their clothes or their breasts were exaggerated, or their butts were drawn really big. Finally, when no one could think of anything else to say, Dr. Richardson said, all of these female action figures are white. There are no people of color in this picture. I felt like it was the first time I'd ever really seen. It was also the first time other than stumbling across a copy of The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison in high school that I'd read an essay by a black woman. A black woman from Appalachia at that rate when we were told the Appalachians were all white. Bell Hooks changed my perspective. It was in college when a visiting missionary taught me that Jesus wasn't white or Caucasian or Christian for that matter. It might seem like these things would have come earlier on in the mid 2000s, but college was the first time I'd really encountered people with different ideas from my own who looked different than me.
I'm not going to sit before you this morning and say that I'm not complete, that I'm completely woke, as the young folks say, <laughs> because I'm not. I am learning and will continuously be learning till the day I no longer walk this earth. I grew up poor and white in a trailer park without my biological father. It was a stereotypical white trash story. I thought I couldn't be racist because I had sisters who were half Mexican and that I had a few black friends. However, just because I wasn't using the N word didn't mean I wasn't racist, still doesn't. That's just the surface stuff. I didn't understand what white privilege was at first. And in fact, I resented and resisted the notion when I first got to divinity school. Not using the N word is the bare minimum. Not thinking that every person of color who goes into the store is going to steal something is the bare minimum. Not telling or laughing at the racist joke your uncle or whoever tells is the bare minimum. Take it a step further. Read books by people of color. Donate and buy products from shops that are owned by people of color and pay full price. Calling out your third cousin on Facebook is great, but what about your brother or sister? What about admitting to your own failings? Can we listen when people of color are outraged and see it as righteous anger without critiquing the way that they respond to injustice? Can we no longer say, I don't see color, but celebrate all the beautiful differences that God has made? We are all made in the image of the divine. The Holy One is a multiplicity of colors and curls and shades. White is not the default. We need to actively be decentering the voice of whiteness in our circles. Personally, I'm going to start having open and honest conversations with my white family and friends. When the rage boils up at the asinine things they say in support, I'm not holding my tongue because that is the conviction of the Holy Spirit in me. Part of learning is laying down the life that we once knew. Once you see, there's no going back to not seeing. The baptism that Jesus is talking about is one of justice. And are we ready? Because the fight for justice isn't just about singing kumbaya and congratulating ourselves for not being racist. It's an ongoing struggle. There's a quote by Bridges McCall that keeps bubbling up for me, and you may know it. The Talmud states, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Beloved, the work is messy. It is hard and it is good. To get down and do the work is to be covered up in all sorts of stuff you weren't expecting. It's a dismantling of the you that you once knew. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Learn to rest, but do not abandon the work. Don't let the fear of getting it wrong keep you from working toward liberation. Amen. I'd like to take a moment and just invite you to go to parkwayunited.org for offering and donate to our church so we can continue doing the good work in our community and also towards dismantling racism in our communities and within ourselves. And now we'll hear some special music by Sean and Ian Nelligan. Uh, it's called The Dreamer. Good morning, Parkway. Coming to you from San Francisco, from the home of my son Ian, his wife Ashley, and their beautiful new baby Island. And uh, 
those of you that have been at Parkway for a while will remember Ian. He grew up with us at the church. And uh, those of you that um, don't know him yet. Nice to meet you. He's happy to meet you. <laughs> the song we're going to do this morning is called The Dreamer. It's written by a fellow named Joe Troop, a uh, North Carolinian. Uh, we appreciate him giving us permission to do it this morning. Um, I think you'll find it to be a powerful song, especially on this Sunday on Independence Day weekend. And um, I think it's all the more powerful because it's a true story. It's written about a, a friend of his. That was beautiful. Thank you, Andrea, for your beautiful word, your vulnerable word for us today. Thank you, Sean and Ian and Joe True. Thank you, Sophie Seavers. <clears throat> Just a couple of quick reminders uh, as we move forward in ministry together. 
um, throughout the month of July, we at Park White United Church of Christ will be receiving a special offering to support the work here locally of uh, organizations engaged in um, dismantling racism and working toward racial equity in education, food, access, and housing. So we will receive those offerings from you throughout this month. Coming up this week, we will have our first sessions. You have a choice, uh, Wednesday at noon or Thursday at seven. We'll begin our discussions on the book, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. Next Sunday at 9.15 for our second Sunday, we really encourage you to join us. Uh, Michelle Johnson and I will be guiding us through some um, experiences, body experiences, as well as summarizing uh, the content of the book, My Grandmother's Hands by uh, Resma Menachem. We hope you will join us for that. And then for Sunday worship, we are going to be focusing next Sunday on uh, Voter Sunday. And so be looking this coming week in your email announcements for a voter commitment card. We hope you will spend some time with and make some commitments in this election year. And we will make offering of those commitments in our worship next Sunday. Delighted to have you all join us today. We're going to have a closing prayer by Izzy and then ascending forth by Andrea. Hello, everyone. I know we learned a lot today from Andrea. Let's just hope we can all put that to use and realize our fault as we continue to try to erase racism. I hope everyone has a wonderful week and let us all go and adjust peace. Thank you, Izzy, for that prayer. Oh, siblings in Christ. That was a lot that the Spirit poured out. <laughs> and I just want to encourage you that the work is good, that your heart is good. It's the system that's bad. And I just pray that you are brave, even though you're scared, to have those hard conversations and to challenge that stuff that comes up in you and pay attention to it because it's important because people are dying and we need to stand in the gap. So go forth knowing you are loved and you were held no matter how bad you mess up. Go forth and adjust peace. Amen. Amen.